Approaching another people, another culture, and then the other is entitled the Lakota language, an expression of Lakota spirituality. Anybody have those? If not, I think there are uh, Paul and Father Joseph will be passing them out to make sure. So just raise your hands if you're missing. Six or seats here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking you if you would just look at the page approaching another people, another culture, another religion. Uh, the author of this very brief statement is Max Warren, born of Irish parents. Uh, he was raised in India. He was an Anglican vicar and missionary and served as general secretary of the Anglican Church Missionary School for 21 years. Of course, he is now deceased. Uh, but this statement of his, I think, speaks uh, to the reality of what we face when we approach any culture not our own. So if we could just take a moment and reflect on these words. Our first task in approaching another people Another culture, another religion, is to take off our shoes. For the place we are approaching is hope. Else we may find ourselves treading on people's dreams. More seriously still, we may forget that God was here before our arrival. When we approach any culture different than our own. I think it's important we do not approach it with presuppositions about what this culture is about, what they believe, what they live. Before I go any further, a very humbling lesson I learned 
when I was first studying the Lakota language and culture, I had spent six years at our Indian school in Chamberlain. And I was studying some of the language and felt that I was beginning to uh, understand it enough that I could say a few words in it. And uh, I was assigned to work in our parishes in Lower Brule and on the Crow Creek Reservations. And the first Sunday, I remember, Father Shea might remember this as well, that I got up and I gave the traditional Lakota greeting before I gave my homily. This is a very simple greeting. My relatives, I come to you with a good heart, and I reach my hand out to each of you. And I said it in Lakota. And afterwards, the tribal chair came up to me and he said, what are you trying to do, teach us how to be Indians? <laughs> now this was not my experience in Texas. Where if I said buenos dias, people like, boy, padrecito, you know. It was not that experience here. And one of the first things I learned that before I should say a single word in Lakota is to realize that for a hundred years, many indigenous peoples were forbidden by law to teach or speak their own language. It was not till 1978 that the Lakota people were actually able to once again speak and teach their own language. So that was only 45 years ago. And I think how humbling it was for me to realize that this tribal chair who was looking at me was seeing somebody who had the audacity to speak his language which he was forbidden to learn or speak in his own community. So what I learned is before ever speaking a word, the Lakota language, and I begin today asking forgiveness of the people who for so many years were forbidden to speak the language that I am privileged to speak today. It's a humbling experience to share this language. So having said that, I think one of the first things that's important to understand, and I think this is true of most indigenous languages, is that the purpose of language is to communicate with God. Interesting. We think of our own native tongues. How do we see them? What is the primary purpose of our language. And so, because the purpose is to speak primarily with God, there are no foul words. There are no curse words. You know, the worst thing you can say to somebody in Lakota is to call him a turkey. <laughs> you know, we laugh at that. But they have no words. Excuse me, no F-bombs, okay? No words that would insult someone. No words that would ever take the name of God in vain. Wow. Something we can learn. The relationship with God in the language is both transcendent and imminent. And yes, they believe in one God. They are monotheistic. Okay? You may have heard all kinds of stories. They see gods everywhere. No. There is one God that they experience as present in all creation. And they refer to him as transcendent Wakam Tanka, which means the great mystery, which is far beyond all human comprehension, but also imminent, Dunkashila, grandfather. Now, what complicates it is also that we have three different speaking groups among what we call the Sioux Nation. We have the Lakota, the L speakers, Dakota, and Nakota, the D and N speakers. Now, what's the difference? The difference primarily is how they substitute L, D, or N. 
in their language. So, Tungkashila, meaning grandfather, in Lakota becomes Tungkashida in Dakota and Tungkashina in Nakota. Where are these groups located? Well, the end speakers are primarily in the northeastern part of South Dakota. The T speakers are in southeastern and eastern, east of the Missouri River. And then west of the Missouri River, you primarily have the L speakers, the Lakota, which would be the largest group. Um, originally, like all indigenous languages, the language was oral. There was no written text of the language. How do we have a written text today? Well, we can thank the Jesuits, one in particular, Father Eugene Yuko, whose Indian name was Wambli Sapa, Black Elk, created a grammar in 1939 and then a dictionary which he, between the years of 1902 and 1954, researched over 24,000 words that became part of this dictionary. And I have a copy of that dictionary here. And uh, if you would take, like to take a look at it, I will leave it over here on the table that you can see later. This right now, to date, is probably the most official Lakota English dictionary that we have available. Uh, and unfortunately, I was not able to find my copy of his grammar, but uh, he also did an amazing grammar. Um, one of the things that I think as we begin to think about a non-European or Indo-European language is that syntax and way of expression is completely different. If I, for instance, was to say the black dog is in the street, in Lakota that would come out shunka sapa king, chunk u king, kata ekta, which means dog, black, the, Street, the, in, is. Imagine trying to speak English like that. And now you're trying to put it into another language. The other noticeable difference in the language is where we put subject pronouns. We have prefix, inflex, and suffix. So if I take a verb like chiki, which means to pray. It happens to be a prefix verb. So it's wachikie, I am praying. But if it was an inflex, it would be chekiwaye. And if it were a suffix, it would be chekiyewa. <laughs> so you have to learn every verb and figure out where that subject pronoun goes in the verb. Then, of course, we have all the other pronouns. So it, it is a challenge for non-native speakers, no matter what your linguistic abilities are, to, to be able to speak the language fluently. Today, with the exception of the Pine Ridge Reservation, primarily about 10% of the people actually still speak the language. And it's sad, because we know when a language dies, a culture dies. A lower rule, probably less than 10% now of the elders speak the language. So uh, efforts were made to try to do an immersion, sending children from the reservation out to the Pine Ridge to the more isolated communities where the language is still spoken. But and then bringing them back and having them mentored by elders in the community was not very successful. It lasted about five years. Francis uh, Whitebird, who was my teacher, uh, was trying to get this going. I worked with him for a while on it, but <coughs> unfortunately, once they came back to Lower Rule, even though they'd meet with an elder once in a while, 
they just slip back and uh, speaking English all the time. Um, today, we have the Lakota language that is officially accepted as a liturgical language. We have, it has been translated into all the parts of the Mass. There is a lectionary in Lakota, and uh, all of the sacraments have rituals that are also in Lakota. Most of the work on that was done by Father Manhart. I don't know. Uh, Dr. Russell may remember him. I lived with him for a couple months. It was a very interesting experience. You know what kind of unique personality he is. But uh, it was a great experience because he taught me a lot about the language in prayer. So having said all this, I'd like to teach you the sign of the cross in Lakota. So if you look on this sheet, uh, the second sheet you received, First of all, we'll learn how to pronounce it, and then I'll show you how it's actually arranged syntactically. So, Ateyapi, you want to try that? Ateyapi, Na, Na, Chinchana, Chinchana, Woniyawakam, Woniyawakam, Shajekion. Very good. Wow. You guys are all ready. Okay. So, Ate Yapi means, Ate means father. Yap, yapi means they call him father. They call him father, Chinchana, and son, Na Wunya. Wunya means spirit or breeze. Wakam, mysterious, sacred. Shaje, name, he, the name, on, it. So, you see that syntax. Very different from English. Let's try it again. Ateya Bina. Ateya Bina. Chinchana. Chinchana. Wunia Wakam. Wunia Wakam. Chaje Kion. Chaje Kion. And let's try the Lord have mercy. Itanshan. Itanshan. Wa Oshilaye. Wa Oshilaye. But that is Itanshan, his Lord or Chief is Itanshan. Wa Onshilaye means mercy on us. Christ Wa Onshilaye. Christ Wa Onshilaye. Itanshan Wa Onshilaye. Itanshan Wa Onshilaye. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Okay. Uh, one last thing I'd like to uh, conclude with is to offer you a blessing in Lakota. It's been a little while since I've done this, so please be patient with me. Um, one of the ways a blessing is always given, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, the reservations, when the federal government set them up, they didn't want to be biased to either of the two major Christian denominations the Catholic and Episcopalian. So they designated one as Catholic and the next one as Episcopalian. Crow Creek Reservation on the east side of the Missouri River is Catholic. Lower Brule, where our priest have served from 19, 1923 on, was designated Episcopalian. Now we have Catholics and Episcopals living on both sides of the river. But the background has really influenced the way people pray. So, beginning with the blessing, they, they pray this hymn in Lakota. Basically, it's sort of a doxology, but it's sung to Old 100. So, I'm going to begin with that and then offer the blessing. Ateya Pichin Hin Kuki. Na woni ya wa kanki he wa kanta ka wa shinaki he wo we ta yu hanu we amen. I'm going to ask you to respond to the greeting. See if you can remember this. Na. Na, 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 na,
Nabu 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 Amen. Amen. I'll uh, entertain some questions afterwards. I'll let Father Shea speak now. people originally lived in the Carolinas. They were the first to domesticate the horse, and so they became very powerful in the country of the USA, and they decided they wanted better land and a better atmosphere. So they moved west, and they kind of went through different tribes fighting, uh, and they made it to South Dakota, and they decided they liked the land, they liked the place, in the summer, they would stay on the plains, and in the winter, they would go to the Black Hills and winter there, and then come back out in the spring. So that's their background, uh, where they came from. Uh, through the wars and the destruction and everything that happened in the, our country, they ended up being placed on reservations. It was the worst of the land in the Dakotas. And they were given the Badlands, if any of you have been out there, the Badlands <coughs> couldn't go a twig there. But the government decided after a while that they could uh, use that area for history, and they discovered archaeological digs and finds. So they moved them off and said, you can't have this land anymore, and put them on another reservation. So that's how they ended up moving. In 1910, they homesteading was open in South Dakota for the first time. And Russian Germans who were in North Dakota and Minnesota and some in the East, they had been Russians that lived, uh, Germans that lived in Russia. Catherine the Great didn't like the high class in Russia. She thought they were lowly. So she went to Germany and recruited from their high class to come and be part of Russia. Then revolutions came, they were thrown out, they ended up in America, most of them farming, and they ended up in South Dakota. And the government kind of developed a checkerboard uh, type of arrangement. Everyone got 100 acres, and you put Native American on one checkerboard, you put some white people on the next one, and maybe they'll rub off, whatever. They want everyone to be alike and similar. And they use farming methods from the east, I grew up on a farm in the east, 100 acres, you can keep 20 cows and make a lowly living in some ways. In South Dakota with 20 acres, you're lucky to keep one cow. 100 acres, you might get <coughs> two to three at the most because it's not as rich, the land, and it's dry, and it's not very good for planting and growing many things. So, Anyways, many in, over time gave up their land, sold it to white farmers who grew and became bigger, some of the, the Russian families. And uh, it became a good area to grow uh, beef for slaughter, for market. And so there's a lot of those ranchers. And they need to make a living anywhere from six to 10,000 acres. That's just how much land they need. But land is much cheaper than in the East. So that's just a little background on what happened from the beginning. The black robes are known in the history as many religious priests that came and lived among them, even a number of sisters. And they always lived with them. They traveled with them when the government chased them down or there was wars. 
the black folks would go with them. So over time, they learned a great respect for black folks. They always uh, honored them and always welcomed them, whether they were priests, brothers, or sisters. That's a little background on, on religion. And the black robes kept with them over time. They never abandoned them. If one group left the area, another group of religious would come in and help. So that was always looked as something good for the Native Americans. They enjoyed very much to <coughs> be part of what was going on in the land that they lived in. And they shared that with the black robes along the way. The, the uh, people were very, Native Americans are very welcoming. There's a, a saying that they're very stoic looking. They're stoic if you're a stranger and if you kind of look down at them, then they'll act like stoic. There's a line that some of them will say, oh, you're just being a big Indian. And they'll laugh and laugh, and, but they'll play that game with someone who kind of questions them or comes in without saying hello and just starts out about this, that, this, that, and they'll play, they would be very stoic looking and they be, and the sign is there being a big Indian, it means they don't answer, they don't reply, they act like they know nothing, and uh, that's a saying, but if they get to know you, if you're welcoming, if you're okay. with them, if you visit them, you're very much approachable and they love to be part of you your life and they like to invite you to be part of their life and celebrate with them. They have a very different mentality. <clears throat> Most of us like to save for the future. We save money, we save things, we uh, put away things. Uh, they only have a little section where they do save things. But normally they get a paycheck on Thursday night every couple weeks they head to town, and the town knows it. All the businesses stock up for that Thursday, and they spend the whole paycheck. Food, toys for the kids, clothing, anything they need, they get till almost, they might come home with three bucks. they got two weeks to go. And you say to them, what are you gonna do if you run out? Ah, God will provide. Oh, my relatives will help me, someone. There have been members of my community who came out there when they, figure that mentality out, they like, oh my God, I, I can't live here. I, I can't understand that. I don't know what's happening. When someone dies, the family is expected to have a wake. Sometimes it's one night, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. So you have a wake service and everyone comes. So you might have a wake service with three to five hundred people. And um, the family's expected to provide a meal in that evening. Uh, and then on the day of the funeral, they provide another meal for that family. And if there's any leftover food at the funeral, after the, fu the burial, uh, the funeral dinner, you have to give it away to people that come. So until everything's gone, free the spirit, let them go. So in families, the tribe will help them at the funeral, but then they also, whatever, little money they might have or they sell things, that's how they arrange for those meals, those gatherings, those funerals. They do a lot of artwork, but it's nothing on a regular basis. They do it when they need it. So a funeral comes home, they're at night beating things, making things, and they sell it. That's how they collect money. If you, one of our priests decided at one point that he would develop a catalog for arts and crafts for Native Americans. Then he couldn't, he saw things, he took pictures, he made the catalog, he got the price. Then he went around asking, could you make 20 of these? Oh, I, I don't need any money right now. <laughs> uh, so the catalog went down the tubes after about a year. <laughs> there was nothing regular about doing it. Uh, so. It's just, it's a different mentality, but sometimes it's kind of, I kind of like the mentality. They're more dependent on God, they're more dependent on nature, they're more dependent on each other. And there are good things. There's bad things in the midst of it because of drugs and alcohol. Uh, somehow that has tainted their outlook. Some of the families sometimes don't really take care of themselves. 
and they totally depend on their relatives. That's not always good. <clears throat> they end up stealing from each other because of drugs and alcohol. Um, so a lot of different arrangements that they have. They have lots of ceremonies. A year after the burial, they have a special dinner to remember the person and they invite everyone. And during that year, every two weeks when they go to town, they pick up things at a store here and there. Uh, maybe handkerchiefs, maybe towels, uh, maybe soap, maybe lotions, maybe jewelry, and they put it away. At the end of the year when they have the dinner, maybe 300 people come, they give everybody gifts in memory of the person who died. So no one really gets ahead in some ways. They were all kind of equal. Because if you have a little money, you're expect and people know it, well, you're expected at your giveaways, you'll have better stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sharing, but it's sharing that it develops a, a system of equality. And then it makes it hard sometimes for any of them to do things on a, on a regular basis, you know, to plan ahead for a long term. <coughs> they like to go places and do things, but sometimes they don't have the money. Uh, education, they like to further education, unless the tribe helps them. It's very hard to get in somewhere, unless they find a scholarship. Uh, so that has made it hard and difficult. But they love ceremonies. Every community has a powwow every year. And they love people to come and visit with them, see their dances, Part of it, and even here in Milwaukee, there was one just three, three weeks back for a weekend. It's a three-day event, and there's usually here in the city. There's about four or five a year, different places. But it also in South Dakota, every new community had one scheduled, and people would just in the summertime they make the rounds. If you have like here, if you, when I was at St. Martin of Tours summer there was lower attendance at church and people said, oh, they've gone vacationing. And I asked one day, doesn't anyone come here for vacation? <laughs> but in South Dakota, they travel the powwow, so that's how they, they spend their summertime dancing. Uh, there's money involved in contests for the dancing, those who do well. They honor their deceased at those powwows, some lots of giveaways. When you hear the word giveaway, it's in terms of gifts and, that they receive and give. Uh, I started out, I spent two summers, 1972, in uh, Cherry Creek, South Dakota, and 1978 in Eagle View. Cherry Creek, there was about 150 homes. Uh, the second night I was there, I went to visit a family. And the mother got up at some point, put on a coat, and I said, where are you going? Traveling, so I went to the bathroom. <laughs> I oh. realized of the 150 homes, there was only four that had electricity, four had a bathroom. That included the little house that we lived in. And uh, it was kind of primitive in 1972 yet. Women would go wash at, outside at a, at a well that had rocks also, and water would flow in, so they would scrub and rub and do all that. Over time, it has changed. It's become much more modern. They fought the government. Now they build their own. They have two construction companies. They build their own houses. They control everything. If you want electricity on the reservation, you have to ask the tribe and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They control the air. So you can't just go and put up a post and ask the electric company to come in. You have to get permission. But they are fun-loving people. They like to enjoy a good laugh. They enjoy kidding, joking around. Uh, I enjoyed my time out there. Probably that's why I stayed there. I was there 22 years. And, uh, 10 years in one place, with, there were 10 missions. <coughs> and the other place, 12, uh, 12 years with six places. Time for no questions. Father Jim or I. Sure, if you have any specific I have, questions, yes. I have one. Um, so they they respect the ministry and the involvement of the priest of the Sacred Heart. 
is there a fine line because they're also protecting their own culture and their own religion? How, how tell me about that give and take when it comes to talking about your faith with like a tribal council or, or is that not done? I'm curious. Well, in Lower Broome, it's been predominantly a Catholic tribal chairman. <laughs> Actually, when I was there, the chairman was in office for like 44 years. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, very much. And in church, uh, on this side were the tribal chairman and all his support group. And on this side was the opposition of <laughs> the BIA. Really? <laughs> You know, I think, I think, at least among the people I've met, there are really three groups. There are the groups who have totally assimilated into Christian religion, Catholic and other denom <coughs> Christian denominations, and want nothing to do with the traditional ways. There are those who have either remained in the traditional ways or gone back to the traditional and want nothing to do with the Christian ways. And then I would say the majority practice both, but they don't see a division between them. So in other words, they, they will come to church on Sunday and be very active, but they probably will also do sweat ceremonies and even participate in Sundance, because they don't see those traditional ways in conflict with their Christian ways. Good question, thank you. Russell. Ties in the two uh, talks, uh, and correct my memory if I'm wrong, probably Jim about this, but and you're talking about language, and if I remember right, uh, Lakota verbs don't have, um, there's no, the verb itself doesn't indicate time. That there's no. Added, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah, the, the, and, it, and that's quite interesting yeah. because it reflects their own this idea of relationship live in with the time. present. I mean, everything's there yeah. in the present. He had to add another verb to indicate the future. Maybe. Right. But anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly true. And I think you're right. It it, it reflects their own relationship to living always in the present. And I guess the way I like to think about that is when God revealed Himself to Moses, He said, "I am." represented himself as the God of the present. So I think we struggle to live in the present because we're always thinking of the future, what's next, what's next, what's next. And one of the things I think that the, the Lakota people have taught me is to focus more on the present and living in the present. See, Father, Father Charles. I'm wondering, Jim, uh, it's been too long since I've been out there. Um, liturgically, are there specific actions during the Mass uh, that, that are particular to the community? It's an excellent question. And the answer I'm going to give you is it really depends on the community. Okay, uh, years ago, when uh, Father Yvonne and I were there, uh, Bishop Chapu uh, brought together a liturgical committee to talk about what are appropriate native practices that could be incorporated into the liturgy. And one of those, of course, is smudging. Uh, but it really depends on the community. I know at Lower Brule, we never did that. I don't think we ever did it at Crow Creek, unless there was something unique that was going on that we may have done that. So it really depends, what is the practice of the community? And I've always felt, again, it's not my place to come in and tell the community how to be Indian. It's not my place to come in and tell them what practices they should be doing. If they were to come to me and say, we find this practice meaningful, then we would have to look at it. But it hasn't been my experience in Lower Brule or in Crow Creek. I don't know, you want to answer that? It's true what you just said. <coughs> they wouldn't want me to do those ceremonies or those actions. They want a native person. At the moment, I don't think we have a native priest 
all of South Dakota. No, the last one died. Yeah. And we do have permanent deacons now, and they're slowly incorporating a few things in the liturgy with them. Uh, so the, the smudging is a, <clears throat> is a purification? Yeah, purification. Yes. Uh, ceremony? <coughs> It is. If you ever go to the Congregation of the Holy Spirit here in Milwaukee, you are always very welcome. They begin with the smudging. Everyone is welcome. And so our guys always go every session, so they kind of know. A little, little longer mass than usual. <laughs> and what smudging is, if you're not familiar with it, is that they take um, cedar and it's burnt, and the smoke from that is then fanned on each individual, usually with like an eagle feather or, or a feather that is considered sacred. And the person accepts the smoke as a sign of humility and asking forgiveness. And that would be done by a leader in... A spiritual leader in their from the community. So yeah. it's kind of like... Well, it is. It's very similar because it would replace yeah. our what we call the penitential act or the sprinkling. Right. Yes. Okay. Very similar. Very okay. parallel. Yeah. Yes, Father Ed. Can you Ed. comment on the uh, relationship with the sacred, uh, the nature, especially with the eagle and the uh, bison the buffalo? Okay, well, you know, just very quickly, uh, the eagle is kind of considered what we would consider the Holy Spirit, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting that Father Buchel's name was Wambli Sapa, Black Eagle. What a, a, a truly a reverent name of respect for him. Um, and the, the bison is also very symbolic, I think, to you know, whether all Dakota people would see it the same way today, it's the idea of self-giving and self-sacrifice. Very similar to what we think of when we think of Christ giving totally of himself. Because the bison gave of its very life to keep the people alive. Remember, prior to reservation life, these were a nation of hunters. And they survived off of the buffalo. And they used every part of the buffalo. So to think of the buffalo as the total gift of self for the survival of the people, you can get the, the similarities. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Good question. I was going to add something on that. At one point, I decided to ask a white family who were descendants from the uh, homesteaders and the Indian family, do you like it when a priest, brother, or sister come to visit? They say, oh, we love it. We love it. I said, what happens when they don't come? What the hell with you? <laughs> you can ask both of them. <laughs> and they do love you come. And they said, they also reminded me, don't make appointments. We're not here, we're no. not going to clean our house. You just come and wow. take us as we are. And they always, you know. Very true. <laughs> I'm sure he got that when he left. I got it when I left. People would say, oh, he loved to come to our homes. He didn't care what it looked like. He ate whatever yeah. we had. It didn't matter. One of the words that, that we learned, and we used to always joke about this, is because, you know, Father Yvonne was talking <coughs> about uh, the, the meals that are at the end of each of the wake services. So if you go to three nights of wake and then a funeral, you get these huge meals. And it starts with fried bread, fried chicken, and then you have wojapi. Wojapi is sort of a, a syrupy dessert made with choke cherries. And I'll never forget my first experience when they said, oh, Father, you're going to really enjoy this wojapi. It's really natural wojapi. I said, what does that mean? Well, the seed inside of the choke cherry is ground up and put right into it. So as you start to eat it, you taste every bit of that seed. So, you know, one of the famous lines we would use, because after a while you couldn't eat all of this stuff, and some of it you weren't sure. So, the famous line, Watecha. Watecha means, I'll take it home with me. It's okay to say Watecha, okay? But to refuse it, 
he has really considered the epitome of ignorance and bad taste among the Lakota people. If you say no thank you, uh -uh. but if you say Watecha, that's okay, you can take it home. Sometimes we had a lot of Watecha. <laughs> Once a year they decorate all the cemeteries oh, yeah. in places with uh, gifts. And they have plates with some different food. You might have uh, uh, hard boiled eggs with a pack of cigarettes, and a bottle of two cans of soda, a bag of candy, a couple sandwiches, whatever. And I'd go around and bless all the graves, and then they would give it away. Oh, Father, come over here. Take this in memory of my mom. And, uh, so I'd come home with eight, 10, 12 of these uh, con little containers. And, well, I couldn't do it all week. I had found people on the rest who loved all that, so I would take all the eggs. And I knew one family to take them to. She loved to fix them. And the candy to someone else. Uh, so you just share. They do the same. So. Be very careful when somebody who is native comes up to you and says, Boy, I really like, you know, your jacket. Or boy, I really <laughs> like how <laughs> tie. Because they're saying, when are you going to give it to me? <laughs> because that's the idea, you know. You, you want to share. And it's really an uncomfortable situation for us, the Washishas, because we say, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm nervous about that. But, but they would, if I would go up to them and say, boy, I really like, they would give it to me and they wouldn't think twice. And it's so humbling to experience that kind of generosity. Very powerful. The word for generosity in Lakota begins with chante, which is heart. And it's considered one of the greatest of the virtues of the Lakota people. This is just a comment, Father Jim. Yeah. But we should have known this about not saying no to a people for mission awareness. <coughs> because at St. Mary's, when we went through the line, oh. I said, oh, you know, what was in the stew? And he said, I said, I don't eat meat. And he goes, it's okay, it's buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, that's okay, so I didn't take it. But I probably offended them now. I didn't know. That's probably I mean, I that's was like, trying that's to be. Like that's why we learned. My uh, big fat Greek <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yes. yes. You don't eat meat. Oh, he'll eat. We'll it's have lamb. a lamb. 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 Lamb.
they have them in, in the back in the little uh, morgue they have. And she unzips the bag and says, okay, Father, I'm going to him now, quick. And I, all I could think of was, excuse me, let me tell you about theology. <laughs> <laughs> you annoyed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all. In Latoya, we say, Bilamia. Or, Bidamia. Or, Bidamia. Or, Bidamia. Thank you. out on display. Uh, we have our artifacts that you might want to visit as well. Um, and just thank you for coming. Oh, and Kathy is going to put the video um, on the wood guide as well, the research guide as well. Thank you. I will leave these two books at the library. This one, Wakam Chekye means holy prayers or sacred prayers, and Oduan means hymns. So it's like a hymnal with prayers in it. And I'll leave these with Diane, and she can display them in the library.